today what I want to do is I want to take you on a little trip uh, and visit sort of the things that I'm obsessed about and the things that I'm most interested about. And it's a little bit different than your usual mushroom uh, presentation, but I hope you enjoy it. And uh, we're going to take a really sort of rapid uh, journey through all the connections that mushrooms and fungi have with other organisms in ecosystems. So I want to just start right away and jump right in. Every once in a while, I'll take a look at the chat and see if there is uh, questions that I might want to stop and talk about for a bit, or maybe we'll wait till towards the end. But I have uh, 340 slides I want to get through. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but I do have quite a few slides, so I want to start moving along. So uh, this program is really different uh, than the title suggests, because what this program is really about is uh, interconnections mostly about how fungi are connected to everything else in the ecosystem. But the thing that I'm most interested in is uh, the evolution of co-adapted species. Over long periods of time, uh, different organisms adapt to each other as they fight for survival and evolve. And that uh, results in all kinds of interesting and sometimes complex relationships among the organisms in an ecosystem. And that's kind of like where I want to go with this program. So uh, also what underwrites all of that is the, uh, the ecology of fungi and other organisms. And an example of that idea is to just begin to realize that mushrooms are habitat as well as objects, uh, organisms that are living their lives in their own way uh, in the forest or wherever they are. They're also habitat for other creatures. And then finally, I want to bring out the idea of biocentrism and environmental responsibility and kind of introduce the idea that we can value biocentrism, uh, and that means uh, equating all living things with an equal, equally important status, rather than the old traditional views of anthropomorphism, where we look at humans as if they were the center of everything, and everything revolves around humans. And in order to really, do, for people in our culture, the mushroom foraging, and uh, the mushroom amateur mycologists and professional mycologists, uh, we need to uh, adapt some kind of cohes cohesive, uh, comprehensive environmental responsibility and a set of ethics uh, in which we learn to value fungi for their own right rather than for uh, how we can utilize it. So that's where I'm going with this, and let's start. So the first thing we have to admit is that uh, insects can be vectors of fungal disease. And so I want to uh, introduce uh, a few examples of how non-native insects can introduce fungal diseases to plants. And uh, those things, when that happens, it changes ecosystems and habitats very quickly. And the same thing can ha that happens with non-native or invasive insects and fungi can also happen when we have rapid environmental change. And what I'm talking about here is global climate change in which climate changes faster then the co-evolved species can adapt and that balance between co-evolved species swings way out of whack. And so that's one of the things I want to explore tonight too. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, this phrase right here, bad bugs. 
because we all tend to use the word bugs in a broad sense that includes all insects. Like if you were at the at a picnic last night, uh, you may say, I got a bunch of bug bites. But what you really mean is you got a bunch of mosquito bites and mosquitoes are flies. So I just want to get that out of the way, right? Bugs uh, can be used in the vernacular to encompass all insects, but bugs are technically, phylogenetically, a distinct group within the insects. So I want to talk about two beetle groups and one real bug group. And these are my three bad bugs that starts this program off. So we have to talk about uh, globalization and the redistribution of the world's biota. Uh, all of a sudden now we have one global economy and everywhere in the world there are tens of thousands of containers arriving on container ships everywhere in the world on all seven continents uh, and they're carrying goods from different parts of the world in all of these container ships they have hitchhikers and so we're redistributing the biota of the world very rapidly now globalization is an old phenomenon it's been going on for hundreds of years probably thousands of years Ever since sailboats were invented, people started traveling to different uh, parts of the world and trading. But now it's accelerated to the point where the species uh, can undergo rapid uh, and unhealthy, unhealthy for ecosystems changes when new actors come on the scene very rapidly. So the first bad bug I want to talk about is not a bug at all. It's a beetle. It's a bark beetle. And I want to talk a little bit about Dutch elm disease. And uh, Dutch elm disease is kind of the poster child for how a beetle and a fungus symbiosis or uh, mutualism can arrive on the scene in a novel habitat and cause a lot of destruction. So the first bad bug is the nightmare on Elm Street. So people that uh, hunt morels, they know what this is. Uh, and this is the beetle gallery of a bark beetle. Uh, and this is the Dutch Elm disease bark beetle gallery. And it has a specific architecture that you learn uh, to identify. And so you know this is an elm tree by this geometry. And the thing I want to point about, uh, point out about the bark beetle, the elm bark beetle, is this central channel right here is where the female has, has burrowed through the bark and right between the bark and the sapwood, she makes this big channel right here. And as she makes that big channel, she lays eggs and she also introduces a fungus, an astomycete, in the opiostoma group. And then when the eggs hatch, the eggs hatch and they tunnel out in these little side channels that you can see. So all the little side channels are uh, larva, and the main channel is the channel that was the nursery. And so this is how, uh, right underneath the bark in the vascular cambium of the tree, the fungus spreads. So the fungus is introduced by the beetle, and then it spreads throughout the vascular cambium uh, of the tree. And so this is Central Park. This is what uh, healthy elm trees look like. Elm trees were the most popular shade tree in America uh, ever since colonial time, uh, right up until the 1950s. In the 1950s, Dutch elm disease really started to decimate most of the American elms in all the urban environments all over America. So this is what the beetle looks like. This is the bark beetle, a, a scolitis bark beetle. And this is the invasive non-native uh, Dutch elm bark beetle. But there's also two native species of bark beetle. And I'll explain how that works uh, in co-evolutionary uh, 
terms in a little in a little bit, and I'm going to keep repeating uh, how this process works. Where a non-native uh, vector infects a tree, and then native uh, species that used to be in balance with the host pile on, and and all together they work together, and it causes the destruction of parts of the habitat. So that's the name of the fungus. Uh, Ophiostoma ulni is the original fungus. And then o Ophiostoma novo ulni is uh, sort of a related species that came along later. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So Dutch elm disease is one of those things that changed the entire landscape of North America. Any town in America, you go to, you'll find an Elm Road, an Elm Street, uh, a place in the town where Elms used to be a dominant characteristic of, the, of uh, the landscape, and they're not there anymore. And we still have Elm trees that are still dying, and that's where we go to look for morels in the springtime. And so this introduction of a non-native fungus beetle combination into a novel cis ecosystem is how this happened uh, fairly quickly and changed the world. So that pattern is what I want to explore a little bit. Uh, a bad bug, and I want to go to another beetle right now, another bark beetle, and I want to, I want to show you how this pattern repeats itself again. But this time with a native beetle and not uh, uh, from the ecosystem not being evolved to the native beetle, but because of climate change, the native beetle and the fungus it introduces is expanding its range too rapidly for the trees to respond to. So same story, beetle carries a fungus, bores into the tree, fungus and beetle together they clog up the vascular system of the tree, eventually leading to death. So this is the mountain pine beetle uh, infestation in the Rocky Mountains. And this particular beetle uh, introduces uh, an opiostomoid like fungus, and it attacks conifers, ponderosa pine, and lodge cone pole pine for the most part. And for a long time, these pine trees uh, were adapted to those attacks, and they weren't decimated the way they are nowadays. And the reason why it happened, I'm going to go back to that slide just for a minute. And the reason, well, that didn't work the way I wanted it to. So the reason this happened in that entire forest is uh, dying, there's two reasons. One reason is climate change allowed the beetle to expand its range northward, and winters are no longer cold enough in parts of the west where the beetles and the fungus get killed off. And the other thing that contributes to this particular problem is the idea of monocultures. Monocultures provide an opportunity for uh, parasites and, uh, and the predator-prey relationship to go out of control, and that's what's happening with uh, mountain bark beetles. And so this is what a mountain bark beetle looks like, kind of an ugly, ugly beetle. Uh, bark beetles are actually weevils, and this is the fungus that this bark beetle carries uh, grossmania, and uh, it's one of the green stain fungi. And uh, we're all used to chlorosiboria, and that's what we call green stain, but there's actually dozens of green stain fungi. So uh, this is like a three-part kind of thing where you have a tree as a host and then a beetle fungus symbiosis that work together to attack the tree. Uh, and so this particular disease, the mountain pine beetle bark 
fetal disease. It illustrates a whole bunch of really cool, interesting ecological uh, ideas. The idea of an evolutionary arms race means that predator and prey, or we could say parasite and host, they're in a continuous war. Uh, the, the parasite gets stronger and more effective, and then the host builds up better defenses. And that uh, goes back and forth over time, and over a long period of time, it comes into a relative uh, series, uh, a relative kind of balance. Uh, and so uh, that balance is an emergent property, and that's kind of a fancy term, but uh, if you've heard my other lectures before about complexity theory, everything I see now in the fungal world and fungal ecosystems, I understand in terms of uh, the complex relationships in ecosystems. And so this balance is an emergent property of that feedback loop between the defenses of a host and the offenses uh, of the parasite. And so that dynamic is something really worth looking at because it's a way for us to understand the forest quite a bit more clearly. So people say, oh yeah, come on, Bill, that sounds complicated. And the point I want to make is that it's not really complicated. It's just complex. So now is the time when I want to uh, introduce how the beetle carries the fungus. This slide is from uh, Chase Myers' uh, study group at Cornell University. And he's done a really a lot of great work in his group at Cornell on the, uh, the whole, the architecture and the functionality of this idea of mycangia. And mycangia is a backpack that beetles have that carries spores. So this is the mycangia of an ambrosia beetle. It's right in that space between uh, the head and the, uh, and the wing covers here. And it's filled up with a pure culture of asexual spores or hyphal uh, fragments uh, that can be easily dispersed and grow very easily. So this is something we're going to see over and over again in the beetle fungus world, in the beetle fungus relationship world, where organisms, mostly insects, uh, have a special adaptation in their physiology to carry spores. And it's called the mycangia. Uh, and so this is how it works. The mycangia is a fungal backpack. And it can, I'm going to go back just for a second here. So I want to point something out. So in the ambrosia beetles, this is where the mycangia is. In the bark beetles, the mycangia is right down here by the jaws. And then later on, uh, we're going to talk about wasps because wasps also have mycangia and their mycangia is right here at the tail near the female's ovipositors. So mycangia uh, is one of those convergent evolutionary morphologies uh, that is not necessarily uh, related in evolutionary terms, but it's repeated uh, by convergences. All right, so the way it works, the mycangia carries spores. Beetles are attracted to basically distressed trees. And then the beetle bores into the sapwood layer, excavates a gallery, and it lays the eggs, its eggs, and inoculates the tree from the backpack. So this is where it gets interesting. Right here at this point, the tree produces resins, and the resins uh, not only clog up the little gallery that the beetle's trying to make, but the resins have volatile uh, phenolic compounds that are toxic to both the beetle and the fungus. And so what the beetle does, it re releases a pheromone, a chemical signal into the air, and it calls more beetles to attack the tree. And so the tree produces more defensive chemicals to fight this beetle in uh, fungus attack. 
and then something remarkable happens. The fungus attacks the resin and it detoxifies the resin and then something really weird happens. The fungus produces a pheromone that's almost the exact same pheromone that the beetle released. And so now the fungus is calling more beetles in to join the fight. When I first read about this, this blew my mind completely. The whole idea that convergent evolution can be extended to pheromones. And so this sort of has led to a whole science of uh, chemical communication. And that's the language of fungi. Chemicals are the language of fungi. And to a certain extent, chemicals are the language of insects and a lot of invertebrates too. So this is really pretty amazing. But together, the beetle and the fungus, they fog up the sapwood and they fill the tree. All right, I want to leave beetles for a little bit and I want to talk about a true bug. So this is a true bug. This is an aphid. Uh, and this is what it carries. It carries this uh, Ascomycete. This is Neonectia fasciadra. And uh, this scale insect right here, which is a true bug, it carry, it allows, it doesn't necessarily carry the Neonectria uh, to the tree. But what the, what the scale insect does is it sucks the juices out of the tree because beech trees have such thin bark. And those little tiny openings provide an opportunity for this nectria to enter the beech tree and start growing underneath the bark. And this particular, uh, neonectria vaginata is non-native. And then it gets joined by two native neonectria. And this scale insect is non-native, but it also gets joined by a native scale insect. And we see this pattern over and over again, where you have a non-native insect fungus combination attack a host, and then the native species join in the fight and they pile on uh, the host. So this is pretty interesting. And so what happens with beech bark disease is eventually that nectria starts to break the, the bark apart because beech bark is so shallow. And it breaks apart in these little circles that sort of mimic uh, the way that the neonectria fruited in like a little tiny fairy ring like that. And eventually the bark gets really weak. And so what happens is what happened right here and we call this beech snap. And beech trees are snapping all over the Northeast right now because beech is being attacked by so many different things. And beech trees are dying very, very quickly, more rapidly than anyone ever imagined. And it's a combination of effects because beech trees are attacked not only by neonectrias, they're also attacked by a new invader, uh, which is a roundworm, a nematode. And so what happens when you have a, a beech tree that dies standing up, uh, as soon as you get a windstorm, that beech tree starts to wobble. And when it starts to wobble, it snaps about 8 to 15 feet from the ground or somewhere in the lower half of the length of the tree. You could think about it like this. Imagine you're holding a seven foot long icicle and you start wobbling it back for, back and forth. It's going to snap about a foot or two feet above your hand. Well, this is happening with beech trees all over the eastern part of the United States. And, uh, it's so serious that, uh, forestry crews now all over are removing beech trees from trails and campgrounds and all those kind of places. So the lesson of these three uh, uh, relationships between insects and fungi attacking trees is that it's changing the characters of ecosystems. And climate change is doing the same thing. 
So these two things together, invasive species and climate change, are causing rapid changes in our ecosystems. And the reason why introduced species are so successful is they don't have any natural enemies. And so whoever they attack in the forest, whatever tree, they have no defense. So that coevolutionary balance that we see in intact ecosystems goes out of whack. And that's because things happen too fast for the species, predator and prey, parasite and host, to co-evolve into a balance. So uh, this is something we're all witnessing. Everybody is part of this. Everybody has seen this. This is the reality of uh, a global commerce and modern day neoliberal uh, capitalist commerce. It's just something we have to, that's not really a political criticism, it's an observation of the facts. So I wanna, I wanna leave uh, the bad stories and jump into a balanced story. The story where, you know, where organisms are in balance, and this is another bark beetle, and we call these bark beetles ambrosia beetles, and they're fungus farm, they farm fungi. Just like ants and termites and wasps, they're fungal farmers. And they also carry fungi in a mycangia, in a mycangia and they have infect trees, and the beetles and the larva, in this case, the ambrosia beetles, they eat only the fungus. And this is what ambrosia beetles look like, not very beautiful, kind of funky. They, all, they look like little buffaloes to me, little weird buffaloes. And uh, so the bark beetle is, I want to compare the two different kinds of bark beetles. So you can see, that one of them tends to go out of balance and the other one tends to be in balance. Bark beetles are weevils and they infect the sap with the trees. And the beetle fungus together, they kill trees by clogging up the vascular cambium and that therefore the tree can't uh, transport nutrients uh, and it can't send photosynthase down to the, ro down to the roots. And so uh, these two, the beetle and the fungus, they feed on the sugars in the sapwood, and uh, the beetles feed on the fungus also, and the fungus also feeds on the vascular cambium of the tree. And these beetles use the tree as a nursery for the most part, and the beetle and the fungus are somewhat codependent. And so I want to contrast that to an ambrosia beetle, and it's another kind of bark beetle, therefore it's also a weevil. And it, it, it unlike the other bark beetles we looked at, uh, ambrosia beetles infect the heartwood of the tree, and they mostly don't hurt the tree. They use the tree as a fungus garden and a nursery, and all they eat is the fungus that they grow in the tree. And the beetle and the fungus are obligate symbionts. The beetle and the fungus are totally codependent on each other, and the fungus does not exist without the beetle. And so that's a great example of what I mean by uh, the evolution of co-adaptive species. These two, over a long period of time, have co-evolved. And that's the phenomena that I'm most interested in when I'm talking about uh, uh, fungi and how they relate to other organisms in the ecosystem. So we learned a little bit about insects uh, in the beetle group and the true bug group being able to carry uh, a fungus and introduce it to a tree and I'm going to bring up the idea here that wood wasps can do exactly the same thing. Female wood wasps also have a mycangia, and it's next to the ovipositor. And wood wasps inoculate trees with fungi when they lay the eggs. 
from the outside of the tree through the ovipositor. I hope I'm not talking too fast because I get excited when I tell these stories and I'm hoping that everybody uh, is following along with me. But when you do a Zoom program, you can't always tell that. But somebody can uh, send me a message if I'm going too fast or if I become incomprehensible in some way. So this is the wasp I'm talking about. It's the pigeon horn tail, uh, Tremex columba. And this is a primitive wood wasp. This is her ovipositor, and her mycangia is right here by the ovipositor. When she lays her eggs, she coats the eggs in a little bit of this fungus, a fungus we all know, Serena unicolor, the mossy maize polypore. So now we have a whole new scenario here. And so let me go back just for a second and clarify that. So we have the wood wasp laid an egg in the tree, mostly maple and beech trees that are already distressed. And then the, the wood wasp egg hatches. And when the wood wasp egg hatches, the, the fungus is already, it's a white rot fungus, Serena. It has already started to break down the lignin the cellulose and the hemicellulose in the wood in the tree, and that makes the wood edible for the grub or the larva of the wood wasp. So that symbiosis here, in this case, what's happening is the wasp is preparing the wood for the larva. A little bit different than the beetles. All right, and then there's another part to this story. All these wood wasps all over the world, they have a parasite. And this is Megarissa atata. This is a giant ichnumid wasp. And what she does, this Megarissa does, is she has a huge ovipositor. And so what she does is she goes to a tree that's infected with Tremex, and there's the little grubs are inside, and they're eating their pre-digested wood. And so what she does is she bore, uses her huge ovipositor to go right into the wood and somehow she can detect exactly where the wood wasp larva is and she paralyzes the wood wasp larva. She stings it and she paralyzes it and then she lays an egg right on top of the wood wasp larva and that wood wasp larva hatches, burrows in to the uh, wood wasp, and eventually kills it. So that's a pretty cool three-part relationship between actually four-part relationship, a primitive wasp and a fungus uh, and a tree, and then a parasite of the wood wasp. So that four-part relationship is a long-term relationship that, again, illustrates this idea of the evolution of coagapid species. And so, and wood wasps exist all over the world. Different wood wasps infect different trees. Cyrix wood wasps infect conifers, and the fungus that they carry is an amlyosterium, and they too are preyed upon by a different Megarissa wasp. And so this pattern repeats itself. Over and over and over again, we see these patterns repeated when it's something that has been allowed to, to evolve over a long period of time. So, little summary here, the wood wasp carry the fungi in a mycangia, infect the tree, and when they lay the egg, and then the larva eats the fungus and the decomposing wood, and then a parasitic wasp uh, joins the, the party. It's pretty cool and it's fascinating. All right, uh, I'm not sure what to call this, uh, but I know that people like it. So this is really uh, one of those things that's reached epic fable proportions, uh, chaga or Internotus obliquus, 
And this is the sterile conch that people like to harvest and make a tea or a decoction with for medicinal reasons. And I'm not going to uh, comment on that. Uh, all I can tell you about that is that it tastes pretty good. I like it. I use it. And it's a sterile growth on birch. And uh, it's not very common at all to find the sexual stage. Uh, and this is completely a sterile con. And the sexual stage of chaga in a notice of Greek is fruits under the bark of a dead birch. And this is what that looks like. I'm just going to mention, in case Adam Boring is here, he showed me a beautiful example of the fruiting body uh, of chaga when I was at the West Virginia foray last summer. And that was the first time in my 35 years of hunting mushrooms I had ever seen it for myself. I had seen pictures of it, but it's really a quite spectacular looking thing. And Adam, if you're out there, I want to thank you again for showing me that. Pretty cool. And so uh, there's a lot of mystery about what this fungus is, what it's doing. And I first heard about this about 10 years ago uh, from Sarah Dole, who's a naturalist from Maine. And she sent me, uh, and she also sent Britt Budyard, uh photos of this thing that she found. And she suspected it was Chaga. Uh, in a notice of weakness, and in fact it was. And so she sent samples of the insects that she collected because we were all guessing that it must be insect dispersed. And then Britt did identify that this is, in fact, the beetle that is probably the main disperser of the spores of the sexual stage of in a notice of weakness. And so that was really kind of one of those good collaborations that can happen through social media and people sharing the things that they find and uh, sharing their curiosity about how things work in the world. So I want to uh, lighten up a little bit and I want to talk about uh, just beetles and, and, and mushrooms for a little bit. And so in the spring after morel season, and you're looking for fungi, oh, the only thing that's fruiting are oysters and megacolibia and pluteus in the fleshy fungi world. And so these are the wood decay fungi, and all of these three groups of mushrooms are fantastic for finding beetles. And so what I want to do is I want to introduce you to the first group of beetles, the pleasing fungus beetles the Erotylidae group of beetles. And the pleasing beetles are really well known because they specialize in Halloween colors and they love fungi. And this is the most common uh, pleasing fungus beetle that's in practically every oyster mushroom you'll ever find in your life and sometimes thousands of them. But you'll all, you also find it in Megacolibia and Pluteus and pretty much every other uh, fleshy fungi that you find in the beginning parts of the year. So, Erotylidae, or the pleasing fungus beetles, and notice the color pattern, orange and black. Even the antenna are half orange and half black. And even the red head is offset by the black eyes, red legs. So I, this is a great group of uh, beetles, and there's a lot of them. Here's some of them. This is Tritoma bigutata. Again, notice the Halloween colors, orange, black, uh, orange, black. Here's another one, Vacne quadro maculata, the four-spotted pleasing fungus beetle, again, the Halloween colors. So orange and black are warning colors in the insect world for the most part. And where everybody's familiar with uh, the mimicry of viceroy butterflies imitating uh, monarch butterflies, because modern butter monarch butterflies are toxic and they are orange and black. It turns out that throughout the beetle world, some beetles 
are, are toxic and they are orange and black. And then there's a whole bunch of imitators who take advantage of the warning coloration, uh, even though they are not toxic. So we see this repeated over and over again. That's another co-evolutionary uh, uh, co-adaptation. This whole idea of Mullering mimicry in which a toxic organism gets imitated by non-toxic organisms and they hide under the umbrella of the perception of toxicity. And this is the beautiful Megalodacne heros, the biggest of the fungus beetles, and I'll return to this beetle a little bit later. I want to introduce you to sap beetles or picnic beetles, and uh, they have a ball-shaped club at the end of their antenna. That's one way to identify them. And they can be found on almost any rotting, decomposed fungus. And they are mold carriers. When you're out hunting mushrooms and you find bow leaves covered in mold or any mushroom covered in mold, a lot of time the way that mold got there was from one of the sap leaves. So they are just mold carriers. That's all. Mold is taking advantage of them and it's getting a free ride to a fungus to parasitize. I included this sap beetle, uh, Pelodes pallidus, because this was unbelievably abundant throughout the Northeast this year because we had a very dry May and a very dry June and then a very wet July. And practically every Xanthoconium bowie I found in the month of July had these beetles in it, tunneling in there and then a week or so later, all those anthoconiums would be covered in mold. So this was the major mold carrying sap beetle of 2023. There's another sap beetle. Uh, and notice again, Halloween colors. Yeah, you gotta love these beetles. So uh, beetles also like soft polypores and the two that they like the most are the early fruit and soft polypores, Cereoporus squamosus, Latoporus sulfurius, and the other sulfur shelves. And uh, both of these fungus are uh, beetle and, and invertebrate gold mines. If you get interested in invertebrates and their relationship uh, to fungi, these are two of the best things to find not when they're fresh and beautiful like this, when they're old and funky. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, darkling beetles. And darkling beetles are common on polypores, but also flesh and fungi. They don't have any really good, easily identifiable morphological characteristics that unites them except for the antenna. 11 segments and the segments are all pretty much the same and their eyes are notched. Those are the two characteristics to look for. And there's 11 species in Connecticut and uh, it includes the most famous of the fungus beetles, the forked fungus beetle, and I'll talk about that one towards the end of the program. But take a look, Halloween colors again. This is a completely different group of beetles, and so Diaparis maculata, Halloween colors, a different group, one of the false darkling beetles. This one does not have uh, the Halloween colors, and this one is sort of unique. Notice the horns, and so this Neomyta bicornis is sexually dimorphic. The males have horns, the females don't. I want to point out right now that all of uh, the photographs in this program are mine, except for about six. And all the ones that are not mine, I, they're either Creative Commons open access photos, or I ask the author permission to use their photo. And this photo is from Bug Guide. It's one of the most beautiful 
uh, beetle photos I've ever seen, and I do have permission to use it, but I can't remember who the photographer is. Sorry. All right. Now, the true polypore fungus beetles, Tetratomidae, uh, you can find these on any uh, polypore at all. And these uh, beetles are kind of dull looking, They're mostly dark like this, but they also almost always have a little bit of orange. So dark bodies, a little bit of orange. Here's two more. This is the most common of the Tetratomidae. Uh, all black except for this one little orange spot right in the space between the pronotum and the elytra. Those are parts of the beetle's back. So I, I wanted to show you this because this space right here is exactly the same space where ambrosia beetles have their mycangia that carries the spores. And the theory about mycangia in this space is that mycangia evolved from a little pit in the beetle's back that at one time emitted a pheromone, uh, a sexual attractant of some kind, and then that particular uh, structure took on an alternative function, and that function became mycangia to carry spores. That's a little aside. But notice how dull the tetratoma they are. They're almost all black, but this one has a little bit of orange right there in the antenna. All right, so. Bugs, you know, we call them bugs. They're not really bugs. A lot of times they're beetles or they're usually flies. When we pick a mushroom we want to eat and we, and, and we get mad because it's full of bugs, we say the damn bugs, but they're not bugs. They're ba they're fly babies and there's maggots. We should call it what it is. And so fly maggots in mushrooms, they come in four or five different families. And these are the families of flies that lay their eggs and make the maggots in the mushrooms you want to eat. The zigzag flies, the four-a-day flies, house flies, your regular uh, musidae, house flies, dark wing fungus gnats, the skyaridae, and fruit flies, like you find on your apples, uh, and then uh, the fungus gnats in general. So these group of flies all lay their eggs in fleshy fungi. <laughs> and they're maggots, there's no way around it. And this is what they look like. They're not beautiful, but they there they are, that's what they look like. They're fairly small, everybody here has seen them. And so a lot of times our favorite mushrooms like bicolored bolates, golden chanterelles, even when they're young and fresh, uh, my friend Terry Stolson from Connecticut, T. Stoll, she calls them born buggy. And that means that even though they look perfect, they already have fly maggots in them. And so that's why when we pick these, we cut them across the stem from the bottom. And if we see maggot tunnels, we move up a little bit and we cut a little bit higher until we get to the part of the mushroom where there's no more maggot tunnels. And then maybe we can salvage this part of the mushroom. And the way that works is the flies, they can detect by chemical signal where the mushroom is going to fruit when it's still below ground. And so they lay their eggs right there in the ground before the mushroom even breaks ground. So when the mushroom breaks ground, the, the little maggots that have hatched in the soil right here, they tunnel right in that spot where the stem meets the soil. There's a little weak spot there. And so that's how they get in the bottom and then they tunnel upwards. So that's born buggy. And this is what fly maggot larval tunnels look like. And this is a darkling fungus gnat. That's what the mother of it all is. So we say just a little extra protein. This is a beautiful uh, Boletus edulis that I found on, a, on an island in the Connecticut River. 
and uh, I brought it into my workshop. I wanted to look at it later, but I forgot about it. And then I got up the next morning and I went into my work workshop and this is what I found. So a lot of times uh, they can be quite numerous when they get established in a big old pound and a half boletus edulis. So a little extra protein, there you see it. All right. This is the group of beetles that I study, and this is a rogue beetle, and this is their characteristic form. Uh, they have long, narrow bodies for the most part, and they have uh, very short wing covers, and a whole bunch of their abdomen is exposed. And they tend to raise their abdomen up like that when they're frightened or when they're uh, in motion and exposed to the elements. And so the road beetles are the most speciose group of beetles. Within the beetles, there's 400,000 different species of beetles worldwide. And in that group, this is the most speciose group. There's thousands of road beetles all over the world in every habitat. And they eat the damn bugs that eat my mushrooms. So they're doing something in the environment we can appreciate. They're hunting down those maggots that are in your mushroom. They're hunting down the other beetles in your, that are in your mushrooms. But they also uh, have adaptations. Some road beetles are spore grazers. They only eat spores. And other road beetles only eat mushroom flesh. That's their sole food. And uh, the predators are the most interesting because they really are apex predator insects in mushrooms. All right. So this is the typical rogue beetle posture when they're exposed, like underneath this amanita that still has its partial veil. I turned this over and this guy started running and it ra they raised their abdomen up like that. Maybe they're trying to look like a scorpion. I don't know. Uh, and this is one of the most colorful of those rogue beetles. Uh, Philanthus curulopinus has this iridescent blue-green wing cover. And very beautiful, and they're very fast, and they're fantastic predators. All right. In Connecticut and a lot of the Northeast, this is the most common rogue beetle that you will find in a mushroom. Uh, Tachinus fimbriatus, they're in just about every mushroom that you can find at some time or another. They can be really numerous. It's common. It's found in boletes, gilled mushrooms, hard and soft polypores, and it's a predator also. It hunts down the maggots and other beetles and primitive insects called springtails. I'll show you a springtail a little bit later. And this is one of the really coolest groups of rogue beetles. They are tiny, the size of a sesame seed, and the only thing that they eat is spores. Over a long period of evolution, their mouth parts have become evolved to only eat spores off either the tubes of boletes or polypores or off the gill faces of agaric mushrooms. And so their mouth parts have these weird little cutting tools and uh, sometimes brushes, and they just walk on the inside, in between the gills, over the surface of the gills, and they're constantly brushing spores into their mouth. And that's how they live. And there's hundreds of them, and they're really difficult uh, to identify. Sometimes you turn a polypore over and you see this. It looks like Cheerios. And these are actually the openings to the bunkers that are made by this row beetle. This is an Oxyporous row beetle or an Oxyporous row beetle. And in a regular uh, foley, that's what it looks like right here. That's their bunker. And inside that uh, opening, there's a channel inside the flesh of the bole, and that uh, road beetle is eating that bole. 
And what it does is as it makes a tunnel, it chews up the mushroom flesh and then it regurgitates it along the perimeter of the opening and it makes a little bunker. And that's very characteristic. And so when you pick a bow, a, a bow leaf that has these road beetles in it, it'll pop its head out and look at you. And then if you move, it'll duck back down and it'll pop up in another bunker in another part and look around there. And so it keeps looking around and then ducking down out of sight. And it's like whack-a-mole pretty much. So this is uh, actually what happened to me that got me so interested in beetles and mushrooms. This happened about 25 years ago. I saw this happen, and I brought it to a coma foray. And a famous naturalist from Maine, Sam Ristick, he explained to me exactly what happened, and he got me hooked on beetles that day 25 years ago. And I've been looking at beetles a little bit, on and off, lately, more and more, ever since then. So here's an Oxyporus road beetle. They're amazing. They're beautiful. They're big. There's only 11 species in, in, in North America, or maybe 13. They only eat mushrooms. You would think with those huge cross mandibles that they were predators. They're not. They're mushroom eaters. They're just like us. They take care of the little baby larva. They feed the baby larva. They guard the eggs. The larva live inside the bully or the guild mushroom, and, and the parents take care of it. And they actually feed the larva. Like you see in the cartoons where the mother seagull regurgitates uh, the fish into the baby seagull's mouth. Well, that's exactly what Oxyphorus road beetles do. They chew up some mushroom and then they spit it into the larva's mouth and that's how they feed their babies. And they're big. So, they've been around a long time. Uh, and these two photographs here are taken from an Oxyphorus road beetle preserved in amber that's 20 million years old. And notice the cross mandibles, just like the road beetle we just saw. And I want you to take a look at this organism here. One of the most amazing, uh, or not organism, organs. And this is an adaptation of the maxillary palp uh, next to the jaws of the beetle. And you can see it again over here. This is the maxillary palp in amber. And so, 20 million years old, and they are unchanged. These are two Oxyporus row beetles I collected in the woods behind my house. You can see the cross mandibles here, exactly the same as it was 20 million years ago. And these are the maxillary palps right below the jaws, exactly the same as the 20 million year old fossil beetle. And so let's take another look. This is a this is a closer look at the maxillary palp, and this is a blow up of all those little pegs in the maxillary palp. And what the beetle uses this for, the beetle tests the nutritional value of the mushroom to judge whether it's good enough to feed its larva. In other words, that beetle puts that little shoe-like thing down on the mushroom, and that beetle decides if that mushroom is good enough to eat, based on the sensory input it gets from all these little pegs on the bottom of the maxillary palps. And that's why I love the Oxyphorus roll of beetles. All right, let's jump over to snails for a minute. Uh, so snails are pretty cool. Uh, slugs are pretty cool. I call slugs homeless snails. This is one of the western slugs that has uh, uh, been transferred somehow or another to the east coast. Now very common. This is Arian subfuscus. And uh, mushrooms are really a huge part of the diet of slugs. And part of that is good because they are very efficient for dispersants. The slug eats 
the, the mushroom or one of the spores, the spores pass through his body. And then as the slug moves on, in that slime trail, it's filled with mushroom spores. And so the fungus gets uh, dispersed that way with the help of the slug. Of course, we don't like slugs because they eat our mushrooms, but this chemistry of slugs is really interesting because they're totally immune to amatoxins, the deadly poisons that we find in mushrooms in certain Amanita and Gallerina. And so that's an interesting biochemical phenomena that people like to observe. Slugs have other interesting chemistries that people are investigating. Uh, and slugs are grazers. When you find a mushroom that looks like this, this is the sign that a slug has been eating this, this mushroom. And they have a mouth part called a radula that has like these little raspy spurs and they scrape flesh off. And then as they scrape the flesh off, they scoop it into their mouths and it has a really characteristic look. When you see a mushroom that's been grazed on by a slug. And then these are leopard slugs, another non native uh, slug that's common in the east. And then sometimes uh, we see something really cool like this. Again, I was with my friend Terry Stoltzen. We were out in the wintertime, I think it was December, looking for crusts. And we found this Biscog oxia, uh, and it had these beautiful, this is a crust fungus that grows on oaks. And when it first emerges in the late fall, it's white like this, and then later on it turns black. But when it's in its active growth phase like this, slugs like it. And these, this is a slug trail that we found all over this Biscog oxia crust fungus. And it was really, really very, very beautiful. And uh, it's something you can look for this December when you guys are out flipping logs, looking for crust fungi. I know you want to do that. All right, let's jump over to millipedes now. This is another group that has an association with fungi. And very recently uh, in... Uh, uh, West Virginia and Virginia at uh, West Virginia University in Morgantown and Virginia Tech. Two groups of researchers have done uh, a nationwide study of this group, uh, uh, the fungus filling, the fungus feeding, sorry, millipedes, and the common one is uh, Brachy, Brachycybe leucantii, and they have all kinds of interesting and very little understood habits. They eat mushrooms, and they eat colonially, and I didn't have a picture uh, of them feeding in a pinwheel, but a lot of times when they feed, there's a fungus in the middle, and all the millipedes have their heads in the fungus, and their bodies are all radiating out like the spokes of a wheel in a pinwheel. And the thing that's interesting about these is nobody knows too much about them. And there's a lot of active research going on right now uh, in those two places. Uh, and if you uh, Google the name Juan in uh, West Virginia University and Virginia Tech, all the good recent publications about fungus feeding millipedes uh, have been produced by this group right here. So I encourage you to do that. Super cool group. Uh, and now it's time to talk about mammals. So we know squirrels love mushrooms. They eat mushrooms. And not only do they eat mushrooms, they pick them and then they stash them up in a tree and they dry them just the same way we dry mushrooms for the winter. Squirrels do this. And if you're lucky and you're paying attention to things and you're looking out in the woods, you can find stashes of dried rusula often up in a tree that squirrels have stashed up. 
And this is slugs, this is squirrel sign. And so we can distinguish the difference between a chipmunk or a squirrel that's been eating our mushroom because of those, these really, really big, uh, incisor scrapings from the buck teeth that everything in the Skyamorpho, Skyamorpho group of mammals has. And so they scrape away the flesh uh, of, a, of a bolete here and they eat it. And the other big ecological function that squirrels uh, give us in, in forested ecosystems is squirrels dig up truffles. They can smell the truffle, they dig it up, and they eat it if they find it, but a lot of times they don't find it, or a lot of times they'll stash it, just like they did uh, with uh, an acorn, or the spores will pass through their body and survive, and the squirrel will just deposit new truffle spores in a new environment when it defecates. So squirrels are really, especially flying squirrels, uh, are especially good dispersers of common truffles. Uh, everybody knows Noah's eagle, and Noah is really good at finding truffles. And uh, he showed me uh, during the winter how he does it. Uh, he looks for those little uh, swirly marks under pine trees where a squirrel's been looking for a truffle. And a lot of times they can smell the truffle, but if the truffle isn't immediately below where they look, they give up. And so Noah just walked over underneath the tree and using his fingers in a couple minutes, underneath those little squirrel uh, swirls in the pine needles, he found a few truffles. And he showed uh, me and a friend of mine uh, exactly how he did that. So that was pretty cool. All right, more mushroom thugs. So this is the famous T. Stoll, Terry Stolson. This is Connie Borodenko. This is Jean Hopkins. These are three of uh, the classiest women, uh, coolest people, mushroom hunters in my mushroom club, and they are fantastic in finding mushrooms and talking about mushrooms and enjoying the whole fantastic hobby of amateur mycology. So they're out there all the time too. And so what the humans have to do with fungus relationships? Well, one thing is invasive species. So let's go back to this for a minute. This is Amanita phylloides. This mushroom, the most toxic mushroom in North America, one of the most toxic mushrooms in the world, was brought here by human commerce through the nursery trade, probably on the roots of cork oak trees as an ectomycorrhizal hitchhiker from Europe. So the nursery trade imported a tree the tree had Amanita phylloides on the roots. They planted the tree in California or wherever, various places. And so Amanita phylloides got transplanted to North America. It's a migrant and it's becoming a very successful migrant because Amanita phylloides has invasive characteristics. And what that means is it reproduces very quickly and efficiently and it's a generalist in its habitat requirement. So it's able to change hosts quickly. It's able to reproduce effectively. And so it spreads all over the place. And here's another mushroom that has the same characteristics. And this mushroom is spreading all over the country. And this is one of the psilocybin containing mushrooms. These are ovoids and ovoids are uh, easily dispersed into wood mulch and uh, by humans either intentionally or accidentally. So humans are spreading mushrooms around the world in a number of different ways. So a couple of oddballs as we get near the end of the program, I have no idea how long I've been talking, maybe too long. 
uh, but we're getting near. And so I want to just touch on some weirdos. Springtails are little round shaped, uh, primitive, uh, insects called hexapods, and they are mostly in the mushroom world spore grazers. They're very common, very numerous. Sometimes one mushroom will have thousands of them. Some of them have elongated bodies, and then the other group are little round-bodied ones called the globular springtails. This is the most uh, interesting fungus gnat, I think, I've ever found. And this is Leptomorphus. And Leptomorphus is a fungus gnat that you find underneath polypores on the hymenium. You may not have ever seen this, but I know you can find this, and I'm going to tell you how to find it. When you turn a polypore over, and that polypore looks like it has a little sheet of thin cellophane on it, and you look at it and you think, oh, there's some slug slime. I'm telling you that is not slug slime. That little thin sheet of cellophane slime is the web that Leptomorphus spins underneath a polypore. And what it's doing is, it during, during the night, it spins the web and it covers part of the polypore hymenium. And then all day long, the spores drop out of the polypore and they fall into that web. And then in the afternoon, later in the day, this fungus, this fungus gnat larva, it eats the whole web. The web has become saturated with spores, and so Leptomorphus eats the web, and then the next night it spins a brand new web. And then if you find this, and if you look for it, you will find it. It's pretty big. It's a quarter of an inch long. Uh, and if you go out there and you start flipping polypores, you'll find it. If you watch it, it has like a little mouth part that spins around. And when it's not eating its own web, it's a spore grazer. And it eats the aerial hypha that grow right at the mouth of the pores and polypores. Just a fantastic fungus gnat. And it has a cousin in New Zealand called Arachnocampa. Arachnocampa is a closely related fungus gnat larva. And this is the cave glowworms of New Zealand. And this is another fungus gnat larva. And it, uh, it hangs down from the cave walls and it's bioluminescent. And it's associated uh, with a fungus. And then insects come to the light and they get trapped in the fungus. And then arachnocampa eats those insects. And it also eats the fungus. So if you go to New Zealand, you have to go see arachnocampa, the, the glowworms of the caves of New Zealand. Just gets better and better. And then in the wintertime, one of the most beautiful polypores I find is Trumides rusudum. And if you start looking at Trumides rusudum in December, you will see things like these strips on the undercarriage there. Or you'll see things like this. This is a gall midge larva. And they spend part of their life inside the tubes, mostly a Trumides rusudum. But then when it gets cold, they crawl into the tube. You can see one here hiding in the tube. And they freeze. And they have a kind of antifreeze in their body. So if you bring home your Trumides hirsutum with all these little orange dots in them, they're going to come back to life. And they're going to start crawling around once your polypore flies out. So, you know, the fun never stops with uh, fungus invertebrate relationships. These things go on and on and on. I want to show you uh, the ash tree bully for a minute uh, because this is the weirdest ectomycorrhizal fungus of them all because it's not really ectomycorrhizal with a root. It's ectomycorrhizal with something that lives in these little sclerotia that you can barely see, these little black balls. This picture uh, I took 
in Connecticut. I was sitting at a picnic table with Roy Holling, and we were looking at bow leaves. And Diana Smith came out of the woods, and she put this on the table, and she said, oh, I found some uh, the late Nellis Murray Lighties, the ash tree bow leaf. And as we looked at it, I think all three of us at the same time noticed that she had also collected all this corrosion. So that was another mind blown moment. Uh, and so this photograph is by Noah Siegel. When you get down and you look inside the little sclerotia that's attached to the ectomycorrhizal roots of an ash tree, there's these little insects in there. And this is the insect, the leaf curl insect. Wait a minute, let's go back just for a minute. So what the insect is doing is it's sucking carbohydrates out of the vac vascular system of the root. And those carbohydrates pass through the body of the aphid. And so the fungus that's already colonized the root is sucking up the carbohydrates from inside the sclerotia that is being produced by the aphid. So this is an ectomycorrhizal fungus that's actually uh, mycorrhizal or symbiotic with the aphid poop or the aphid uh, excrement inside the gall, the sclerotia, on the root of ash trees. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what is going to happen to that fungus and that aphid now that all the ash trees are dying? Something to look for in the future. I know I did not find a single Philippe Nellis Murioides this past season, probably because most of the ash trees in Connecticut were dead. I want to jump back to uh, beech trees for just a minute to talk about the boogie woogie aphid. This is another aphid, the woolly beech aphid. This, these are also, this is a whole colonial feeding colony. And what they're doing is they are also sucking the carbohydrates out of the photosynthate products of the beech tree. And this is what they look like up close. And the reason we call them a boogie woogie aphid is if you disturb them, they all start waving their little feathered butts around. And it's really pretty comical if you go on YouTube and see YouTube videos of them dancing around. And but this is how cool they look. The first time I ever forayed with Kathy Hodge from Cornell, we found these on a beech tree, and I got so excited. I was over the top excited about finding them that Kathy sent me this photograph of an individual uh, because I told her I didn't have a good photograph. So this is Kathy Hodge's photograph. And so as that, as those sugars leak out of the butts of those woolly uh, aphids, they get colonized by this fungus, Scoria spongiosis, or Scoria spongiosis, and it's bright orange and yellow and gelatinous at first, and then over a few months it gets black and crusty. And it's really cool to find these. And this fungus is in obligate. Uh, symbiont or it needs to have the sugars from beech aphids or else alder aphids to grow. That's its uh that's its substrate. It, you can't find this except on the substrate of the exudates of one of the aphids. All right. So the glebe lovers we can't leave without talking about the glebe eaters. Stinkhorns, this is a great example of adaptive coevolution. Stinkhorns have evolved to produce their spores in this nasty, funky mix of goo that smells like decomposing protein. And so it attracts flies and other insects, and that's how it disperses its spores. And the beetle that you're most likely to find on a stinkhorn is this beetle right here. That's the American carrion beetle. All right. 
last part of the program, and then if we have time, if I haven't gone on too long, I'll take a few questions, uh, or uh, maybe Annie can feed me, or somebody can feed me some questions. Uh, but I want to talk about Ganoderma species, and I want to talk about conservation of polypores a little bit. And the reason for that is, for one thing, the pork fungus beetle, this incredible false darkum beetle, Polytotherus, uh, Polytotherus cornatus, is this really super cool beetle that only lives in polypores. Ganodermas for the most part, and they spend their whole life in the Ganoderma. The males have horns, and they fight other males in big colonial gatherings at night on the top of a Ganoderma, either one of the lacquered Ganodermas or a regular Ganoderma like Ganoderma aplanatum. And they try to push each other off uh, the fruit body, the shelf, so they're the last beetle standing, so they get the girl. And then there's other really incredible things about this beetle. Uh, when they mate, the male climbs on top of the female backwards, head to tail, and he rubs his belly on two horns that she has on her back. And by rubbing his belly on those horns, it makes a sound called the stridulation, but anyway, the regular person way to understand this is the male serenades the female. And if she likes the music he's making, she'll signal him and then he'll get off and they will continue to mate. And this is what the grubs look like. They're big, they're almost an inch long, three quarters of an inch long. They live inside Ganoderma over the winter which is why I'm encouraging you to leave some Ganoderma behind when you find them. And then who else lives in, in Rishi? My favorite pleasing fungus beetle, uh, Megalodacne, one inch long, one of the most beautiful beetles in the world. They live their entire life inside the lactate Ganodermas. They can't live without them, as far as I know, uh, like the horned fungus beetles. And these two beetle species, these are the poster children uh, for the conservation of Ganoderma. And so I want to encourage you to save the polypores. This is the way I like to see Reefy, where nobody has found it all year. And it's probably full of larva. And so I just want to thank everybody, uh, if you're still with me, for listening to me sort of do a monologue for an hour or so. Thank you very much. Uh, that was awesome, Bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're getting as much of a standing ovation as is possible via Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's that terrific. Was um so and many many compliments here in the chat thank you from maine thank you marvelous and informative i do have a question um a little bit earlier that came in from uh indigo that was can you repeat your explanation of how mycangia work well, mycangia function yes yeah so what uh they function by the beetle actively collecting either conidia spores or uh, vegetative hyphal tips. So uh, one of two uh, forms of vegetative reproduction, they gather them and they actively fill up that little backpack with a pure culture of that particular fungus. And they keep it stashed there until they, uh, in the case of bark beetles, until they bore in to the space between the bark and the sapwood. And then the mycangia is overflowing with these propagules and they sort of leak out as the beetle uh, uh, tunnels its way through the wood. 
And then uh, in other cases, the mycangia is a pouch right near the jaws, and the action of the jaws uh, sort of leaks the spores or the vegetative propagals out into the wood. And then in the case of wood wasps, the pouch is actually, the mycangia is actually connected by a tube uh, to the ovipositor. And the wood wasp actually uh, injects the, the, the fungal propagules into the tube of the ovipositor when she lays her eggs. I hope that's clear. No, that's a great, I think that's an excellent explanation. Um, we have another question about my kanji, but first I see Elizabeth actually has her hand up and I love a live question. So hop on. Hi, um, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so this is a little bit outside of the scope of your talk, but I have been wondering, I feel like in the past couple of years, I found almost an undue number of like Lepidoptera uh, larvae on fungi. And I'm wondering, I know that like in, in North America, there are no Lepidoptera that feed on fungi, but I'm wondering if there's any like thing that you know about that might be um, related to like those like caterpillars or whatnot um, feeding on fungi as an alternative food source. I know that that's not supposed to be something that happens here in North America, but it, I, it it's, it's interesting because I feel like I've, I've seen more than seems like, like it seems surprising. Yeah, I'm not really too knowledgeable about that, but I do know that there are micro lips that do uh, uh, overposit in polypores. Uh, Trimedes particularly, and there are lepidoptins that, uh, uh, of course, are not uncommon in lichens. And so if you want to expand the idea of fungi to lichens, uh, there are lepidoptera associated with lichens. But I don't really know that much about, uh, and I, I looked, uh, and I couldn't really find uh, much information at all. But I do find uh, uh, moths and uh, sawflies and uh, butterfly uh, larvae on fungi. And I have a few times found them in fungi. And I don't know if they're just taking advantage opportunistically for a place to pupate. Uh, or not, but not never regularly, and I can't say I've ever found any particular single species multiple times. That's all I got. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I, I that's really neat also about the lichen because, yeah, I didn't know about that. Well, Chris has their hand up. Chris, do you want to hop on? Yeah, sure. Thank you. First off, uh, fascinating talk. Really appreciate that. I'm wondering if anybody you know, or maybe yourself, has gone, you know, 10x, 100x greater magnification and look for things like tardigrades and rotifers and nematodes, maybe even ciliates inside longer lived mushrooms like polypores and conchs and such. Yeah, I have done that because I just, I'm a freak and I look for things everywhere. Uh, you know, so. I bring mushrooms home all the time and break them apart just to see what I can find in there. And particularly uh, uh, later in the year when there's not so many edible mushrooms out. And it gets to like this time of year in November when I go out with my friends that are hardcore log flippers. Uh, and so I try to extend my mushroom season as late as I possibly can. Uh, I see my friend T. Stoll is here. She keeps me company. We go out log flipping. And I do look for whatever I can find when I bring stuff home. Uh, but I don't have any specific ideas about which ones are common or, you know, anything like that. Yeah, but I, well, I appreciate I'm, that. I'm curious like you about who else lives there. When I see a mushroom, I... I I talk to the mushroom, but I assume everybody does. And when I look at a mushroom, I usually say, what are you doing here? Because I want to know what the mushroom is doing. And I also want to know, 
who else is in there? So, I mean, I, it's a mental thing, you know? So I go through that process all the time. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I feel for, like, for, I I feel like 40 years ago, we worked in a lab where we looked at these kinds of things in lichens, you know, ciliates yeah. and flagellates, uh, rotifers, et cetera. But yeah. I don't see anybody doing that kind of work for the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know anything about that, but I'm sure somebody is doing it somewhere. That's but hope. Thank you. Now, I just want to give folks the opportunity. Not everyone might know how to raise their hand, so literally just unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. If if not, we do have a couple in the chat, but please definitely want to prioritize people who are brave enough to talk I'll out throw, loud. I'll throw one in there. I was just wondering right. um, when you were talking about the wood wasps and uh the uh serena i heard that the serena actually emits a pheromone and i know you mentioned pheromones earlier i just was wondering about that like i thought that it released a pheromone that attracted the maybe the parasitic wasp i have heard that also uh but i've never been able to confirm that and i have also heard uh that the uh ichnomid wasp megarissa uh is detecting the larva itself and that this and and not the fungus but i've heard both but i have no confirmation either way if the real attractant uh that the parasitic wasp is keyed into if the chemical uh signal is coming from the fungus or the larva grub so I, I can't answer that because I don't know. So I have thought the same thing because <laughs> I have read both. Cool. Thanks. And thanks for coming. It was great. Oh, that was, it's fun. It's so good to see so many people interested in this side row off of fungi. I like the side rows. Yeah, that's the plus side of, of Zoom. Even, you know, it's not as fun as a mushroom festival, but it's nice to see how many people are excited um, all over, really all over the world. We've got people kind of chiming in in the chat where they're coming from. There was a question um, from Cindy. The spore carrying mycangia feature seems widespread across distantly to unrelated species. Any thoughts on whether it's a kind of convergent evolution or something from a common ancestor? Yeah, definitely convergent evolution, uh, particularly uh, when it occurs in different orders of insects. For instance, mycangia occur in Hymenoptera, uh, the wasps, and uh, Coleoptera, the beetles. So that's definitely not an evolutionary uh, uh, connection. That's a convergence. And so I don't know how much convergency there is within the weevils or the bark beetles or the ambrosia beetles but i'm going to guess that there's a convergency in uh the morphology of mycangia between ambrosia bark beetles and regular bark beetles yeah cool idea yeah convergency is fascinating and the more you investigate the ecology and the biology of fungi and their associates, the more convergences you find, which is fun. Totally fun. I, I think like the flip side of the fun of convergent evolution is the fun of, of people horizontally passing genes. That's also very interesting to me. It's like, hey, you should try this uh, amatoxin thing. It's great. <laughs> yeah, right. Horizontal yeah. gene transfer is absolutely fascinating. It's cool too, yeah. It's just, there's so much to learn and there's so many interesting things to investigate. For sure. Well, Claudette asked, can you tell, and I know that we're coming up on our time. So this is the last one I'll take from the chat. And then if maybe one more person wants to say anything, they could. But Claudette said, could you tell us one lesser known thing about bugs or, or cordyceps? So it sounds like she wants a fun, fun weird fact, which I feel like we got a lot of, but on, so, on cordyceps so, facts, you didn't talk about cordyceps really. Before, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, <laughs> unfortunately, I could have gone on for hours and I uh, intentionally omitted cordyceps because they are just too fascinating and they deserve their own hour. 
And so I don't know. I'd like to have you back for that hour when you want to do it. <laughs> Let us know. Yeah, I mean, cordyceps are just, it's completely amazing. I'll tell you the thing that interests me the most about cordyceps. And that is the evolution uh, of cordyceps uh, hosts from beetles and beetle larvae in decayed wood on the forest floor to summit disease. So the idea of summit disease are all the cordyceps species that exercise mind control and they uh, somehow control the host to climb. I have a section of another program I do about summit disease and summit disease occurs all over the insect world. The Pennsylvania leather wing beetles get attacked by a cordyceps and those beetles, flower beetles, they climb to the top of a wildflower and they die there. And then, you know, the uh, entomorpha uh, uh, hypocreales that kill flies cause flies to climb up and die in a window. And then, of course, leaf cutter ants and uh, uh, they have a completely weird uh, variation of cordyceps because the true leaf cutter ants, uh, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, they don't climb high. They climb from the summit down to exactly 25 centimeters above the forest floor. And so other ant, other carpenter ants infected by, uh, cordyceps climb up, but the classic, uh, cordyceps unilateralis they climbed down. So that whole phenomenon. And uh, we saw a great program at uh, NAMF this year uh, by uh, the new curator of the Botanical Gardens, uh, of the uh, Fungaria at the New York Botanical Gardens on cordyceps. And he was talking about the evolution of summit disease from the forest floor in rotten wood, in beetle larva, up to the canopy of the trees, in uh, in things like these. So that part of cordyceps is completely fascinating to me. Totally. Well, I, I guess I think we could probably ask questions all night, but I want to be mindful of Bill's time because he's been so generous with it. And, you know, thank you so much. And and it was just a great crowd. So thank you to everyone who came oh, out. I want to I say hello you. to all my friends yeah. <laughs> who uh, tuned in on me. I see Terry and Dee and Nancy and Suzanne and people I know from all over the place. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in on this program. Lots of familiar Myco friend faces, many whom I would like to meet in real life. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you so everybody much. yeah and these our meetings are open it's the first tuesday of every month and y'all are welcome to to join anytime they're always open to the public and um we also record these meetings and put the recordings up on our youtube channel so if there were things that you didn't catch uh the first time around you can go back and listen again and pass it on to your friends awesome, awesome. thank you everybody Thanks for coming. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil.